The Y Curve with Phil Dobby and Roger Hearing. Growth, growth and growth. That's what the new government says the UK needs and wants. But how? What can we do more of? Services have dominated our economy for the last 40 years. But we used to be the workshop of the world. Should we be going back to making stuff? In a world where computer chips, software and AI engineering are the fuel of economic success, is that where we need to concentrate our energies? Is manufacturing rather than services what the UK needs now? The why? Curve. So let me give you some numbers to, to start with. In numbers, 1997, you. yeah, I know. Almost four and a half million uh, people in 1997 were employed in manufacturing in the UK. That's about 2.7 million uh, now out of right. a workforce of 33 million people. So it's about 8% of the workforce in the UK is now involved in manufacturing. Making stuff. Making stuff, uh, which is about the same as the UK, a uh, US, I should say, in percentage mm. terms. Of course, China, 112 million people yeah. are involved in manufacturing there. Um, but there are facing labor shortages yeah. because labor costs are going up right. so there's an opportunity there that, that we, can you know, take we, up shipped, we shipped all of those jobs over there because mm-hmm. it was cheap labor and it's not cheap labor anymore right. but also you know we've got a whole load of new innovation that's happening that's allowing manufacturing to happen without people without as many people ah, anyway. so that's so the question tool. is yeah. are we reaching the point where you know it switches over where we can make stuff with fewer people uh, i mean what was the point somebody made about manufacturing these days uh, you just need uh, one man and a dog uh, one man to turn the machine on and the dog to make sure he doesn't turn it off ah and right. the, you know, so and that's all it needs <laughs> but 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 it's what we make is the thing i mean it's yeah. not you know it's not widget it's, it's not what well, maybe it is widgets still but isn't the point that it's the it's the high tech area that you know this is opening up now making in the sense well, of maybe making programs through which we can access ai maybe making microchips i mean that's well, what's keeping taiwan afloat yeah but then you know can we compete in those spaces we don't have we don't have well, the, we've got to haven't we well i don't know this maybe there's other areas whatever it is we do though we have to export more mm. because if we want to grow so the government is saying we want growth growth mm. growth and mm. their idea is if we can grow more then there's more money coming into the yeah. government coffers that's going to pay for the services that we need and they're right to a point but that money has got to come from overseas because when you think about it mm. the amount of money if you've got to get growth in the economy you've got to have more money in the economy and that money can either come from well uh, uh, really the easiest way is yeah. to get it to come from overseas right right if you've got more money if people are just earning more in the uk then that just pushes the the price of everything up the, the money supply has got to grow and the easiest right. way the only two ways you can grow the money supply one is by borrowing stuff by borrowing money mm. from banks and the other way is to just increase your exports but right. we've got the problem that we've got a 30 30 or 35 billion pound uh, deficit. Right. So we're actually seeing our money going overseas. If we could get that money to come back, then that's 35 well, or 40 Why don't we billion. set up something called the city where we lend people money and then they pay money into us, you know, in a sort of square mile in the... Yeah. Like, well, let's say that, London. That, let's about, say London. And that is about a quarter of our exports well, comes from financial obviously. services. But the question is, have we, have we has that plateaued? Have we gone as far as we can with that? Mm. And the answer is probably yes. Uh, so we need to make more money from other things. And mm. yeah, I mean, so it could be for in the tech space. But you know what, also, just think back. I mean, what is Britain good at or what did we have a reputation for before we went into, uh, you know, before we stuffed things up by... Mm, invading out. other people's countries? <laughs> well, we did, we're pretty good at that. I don't know whether you can make money out of that, though. It just becomes an expensive <laughs> exercise. Well, maybe armaments. Well, yeah, British areas, but BAE Systems, you know, is mm. one of our big exporters. Mm. But, you know, the, the whole cool Britannia thing, I think we were onto something mm. there. You know, we've got brand Britain. It, yes. I think is a part of it. You know, we we used to make, and we still do to an extent. The the, the brands that are surviving are the high end brands. You know, high end cars that cost a quarter of a million pounds to buy. Mm. We still make them. We still ship them overseas because they're seen as prestige brands. And Britain has that element of prestige attached to it. And I think we could leverage that in a great. Well, deal. this is what we need to do. We need to sell our brand. So what yeah. we'll do is we go out to the world and say, look, you can put your our brand on your thing if you give us lots of money. <laughs> we can say it's made in Britain, even exactly. though it's not. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. We got, we, you can have a little union jack on but i mean that's i think that's it you know it's like trying mm. to it's because you look at the we still a quarter of mm. our manufacturing mm. exports are still cars yeah. and it's rolls royce it's bentley it's jaguar they're all at market yeah, but, car yeah, but brands. the world is moving towards evs and yes they're pricing well, and the rest of it but, electric and, electric bentley's yes but there are much cheaper ones coming i know from but China. it's not the cost that's the thing for Prestige those, for those people cars? yeah i think so 
Yeah, I think so You've long got as... One. Yeah, well, I have, but it's made in China. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's a Volvo made in China. Uh, but I think that's, a, yeah. you know, that's an area. It's like, how can we be innovative, but in the premium brand space? Because we've got that ability. And then if you think about it, mm. uh, if you're looking at a strategy, we, we're also, you know, the film industry loves the UK. Yes. Because we've got great filming locations. Right. And very often, the sorts of movies that they're filming are yeah. more upmarket prestige movies. So prestige so you, is where we need to I be. I think this is prestige the overall Friends, so All right. All right. Well, whatever it is, it's, it's got to be increasing our export earnings so that more money is physically coming in. Imagine that. More money mm. comes into the country. You're working on something that's actually earning money for the country overseas. Mm. You're paying more tax on that. The company, yes. the country is taxing that profit. It's win-win. It's win-win, and that's the money that pays for well, the services. Let's that, you know, talk, right on that. Let's talk to someone support. who studied this in some depth. And that's Ali Bigdelli. He's Professor of Industrial Service Innovation at Aston University, and he joins us now. Yes, so Ali, I mean, just before you came on, I was talking about, you know, that the, the, we need if we need to innovate, we need to innovate for exports. That's got to be our focus, hasn't it, as, a, as an economy. We need to bring more money in. We've got to get rid of that balance of trade deficit so that, you know, for the Labour government that wants to get this growth... We're only going to get together growth from more money coming in from from overseas, and that's got to be our focus. Yes, I mean, if I um, if I step back slightly to to be able to explain to you a little bit about what servitizers and what 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 the focus of of my research and our research in the advanced services group at Aston is, um, would that be okay if if I explain it? Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah, so yeah. so yeah. Th- we we focus on this this strange word uh, uh, and concepts of servitization, and um, uh, when you think about this as a, as a concept, you can define it in different ways, depending on who you're speaking with, what part of the organizations they're in, if you're talking about import or export, or what sectors actually you, you're talking about. But in essence, it was born in the, um, in the manufacturing kind of context. It was in the context of uh, companies that are making things and, and selling the outrights. Um, and they were all uh, providing some levels of services like warranties, spare parts, etc. And um, about, let's say, a decade ago or more, a couple of companies started to explore the innovation of providing more to their customers. And we can discuss about the reasoning of why they've started to go through that route. Uh, but the the big kind of drive was around um, making more money, making more revenue through through their offering. Is that, so is that were- Ali, a way of, of basically enhancing uh, the product? You, you make something, you, as you say, add services alongside it to get it to people to want it. And that is... Is that the way forward in order to increase the impact of the what manufacturing goes on in Britain? Yes. Um, and and as I said, there, there has been there have been different trigger points why companies or why different industries have put move into this space. Um, initially it was, for instance, for some of the industries, it was about competition from low cost economies, uh, countries like China, India, etc. They thought they needed to do more. Their products were becoming commodity for their customers. Um, and they wanted to address some of the key challenges that their customers were facing. So it's what we what we would have called value add in the old yes, days. Yes. Right. Absolutely. So value so so in different contexts you can hear value added services. So basically if you imagine the the business to business context um, they started to add lots of use digital technologies. They started to add lots of sensors um, and uh, lots of uh, kind of IT capabilities um, um, and uh, software capabilities to be able to capture data from the use of their machines, for instance. So if, you, if you're a manufacturer of, a, of an excavator or a digger, you started to put lots of sensors around the machines to be able to monitor how your customers, which can be a, a mining company or a construction company, how they're actually using your machines in their sites to be able to provide them with insights. And they started to monetize those insights as well. So that was the what we refer to as kind of like intermediate type services that a lot of companies have started to actually offer to their customers. Our interest and what where we feel that the the the, the greatest innovation can happen is into these advanced services, which really focuses on the outcome that is enabled by the use of the products. So you forget about what product you're using. All you care about is a dig in a, 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 a hole in your in your side, or a dig in, in in your side, or the constructions, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So today, for instance, the the most iconic example of this is, for instance, is the Rolls Royce powered by the hour. 
So the airlines and uh, uh, they don't really, in the layman term, they don't really buy the engines of the manufacturer of Rolls Royce. They actually use the capability and thrust to move their passengers from A to B, and they pay per hour to the manufacturers. And they are in charge of all the maintenance, all the repair, all the overhaul, or overhauls, and everything that goes with the actual uh, gas turbines. So that's the that's the idea of moving. So it's almost like the and we're seeing that in lots of areas, mm. aren't we? This Absolutely. is almost like a subscription model where you're not buying something. But how does that give? I mean, Rolls Royce obviously is a you know a, a partially UK company, mm-hmm. and it's and, but and but I mean, how does that? How has Britain got any strength against anybody else in this area? Because I would have thought what you're talking about. A lot of this is IT driven, isn't it? And we you know we're a bit behind the eight ball on that, aren't we? Um. Yeah, if you if you think about the digital digital technologies and IT, it's just a it's just one enabler of the whole new business model, if you want. Um, where we are in the UK, no, the the majority of the successful cases, I would say, are actually coming out of the UK and, and Europe, to be honest. So most of the most of the businesses, as I said, it was. It started with manufacturing industrial firms that has recently been moved into other industries as well. So, for instance, we've been speaking with uh, with healthcare uh, providers, with uh, with the NHS, as to how can we move a lot of their operations to focus on the outcome, which is the uh, the, um, the the health and wealth of 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 their of their customers. How can we move towards focusing on the outcome rather than what processes and what products actually we are actually using? So, so, so Ali, the I mean, we were talking at the beginning of this really about the difference between you know the way that UK has been preeminently involved in services in terms yeah. of things it can raise money with internationally, yeah. and not so much manufacturing. But what you're talking about really is a combination of both. Do you think that is the answer that we we move we, we, as you say? Servitize manufacturing, and that kind of offering is something almost uniquely that the UK could do and earn money. Correct. And in our latest book, uh, it's called Servitization Strategy, which just came out a couple of months ago. Um, one of the instances is those countries that have been generally good with services uh, and be able to actually offer services to the, to the customers in a variety of different contexts, and the UK being one of them, they've been actually in the forefront of servitization in different industries because they can understand their customers. They can understand what is it, what what are the pain points uh, for their customers? What is it that keeps them awake at night? And they are the ones who can actually move into that space of focusing on the outcome. Um, so why would, why would we the, be better at that than anybody else, though? For example, what's the, so China is creating a lot of uh, manufactured products. I've got a little, I've just, my listeners know this full well because Roger keeps on mentioning it more than I do now. I've just bought a, a, a Chinese car. It's a Volvo, a but it's made in it's, China. It's very prestige, you have to remember that. It's a that. Volvo. It's not that prestigious, <laughs> is it? Uh, it's not exactly a uh, Bentley, but it's, um, but it, I mean, you know, there's add ons in that, in that it's got data, a can't help, you know, that's provided with mm. it, a can't help feeling that there's going to be a lot of extra value added services that come from the information that's being gathered uh, as, as part of the ownership of that car. Um, and, so I can see lots of value added potential for that, but it's you know it's made in China. What's yeah. what could we add to that? You know that the Chinese can't do. It's it's a very good question, and to be honest, if we haven't ranked the countries based on based on servitization, and it's very difficult to do that because a lot of the businesses that we're working with are multinationals, um, and unfortunately, there are not so many. V- British manufacturers have left, I would say, um, in a sense that they're all getting multinationals. But having said that, um, a couple of years back, we've been uh, we've been working with over 300 uh, small, medium enterprises in the West Midland areas as part of one of our projects. And what we've tried to do with them, and as you can see, they what they refer to as sometimes the metal bashers, uh, they are very much focusing on commoditized products and they wanted to compete in international market and they wanted to do more uh, for the customers. So they've started to focus on these new business models using digital technologies to actually uh, uh, do, for, do, do more for their customers all around the world, it's not just the not just the uh, the UK customers. So, when it comes to because I've worked with lots of lots of businesses across the world, I can say that we are in the forefront of the the, the whole adoption of servitized business models. And, but to be honest, 
the, the reason being um, uh, competition from, from low cost economies could be one of them being very good at this. We are a service economy. Uh, so, so that has been, I would say that's, that's helped a lot of the well, concept. Well, let me pick up on that point, Ali, because you mentioned earlier about multinational, yep. a lot of com- big companies are multinational. If I were a big multinational, I'm thinking in the terms you're talking mm. about, the metal bashers I'm going to have to pay a lot less to are in other countries, not Britain. So I could get them to do the metal bashing there, the actual manufacturing, mm. and the servitized bit of it I could get done here, if that's the capability we have. But it doesn't mean that manufacturing is going to be particularly a thing that the UK is going to go ahead with. Yeah, that, that's true. But then when it comes to when you – so the, the whole idea with servitization is ultimately you will be um, – you will remain as the owner of the assets, okay? Um, although there's always a financier in between, et cetera, which, which we, we can get into that. It's it's a bit complex. But ultimately, the, the, the producer and the provider of the product will remain as the owner of the product. And the customers get to use it and they pay as they use it. So they need so to a kind maintain. of leasing system almost, that kind of The idea. leasing is, is what we refer to as the revenue model. So it's one element of the whole servitized business model is the revenue model. It's how you're charging the customer. But the actual offering, which is the, 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 the product, and the the uh, the digital technology wrapped around it remains the assets of the manufacturers. So they need to make sure that it's that's up to date, that it's always uh, up and running. Because you ultimately these these um, these are the uh, like a rewards and penalty regimes involving the contracts. So if the if the customer's operations has been disrupted because there's something wrong with your products or with the products, you actually have to pay penalty. Um, so, for instance, the 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 if you imagine the the uh, the contract between Avanti and um, and uh, um, um, Alstom as a manufacturer of the trains, there's, there's there's a penalty regime involved. So, if the train is delayed, let's say from London Euston to Birmingham New Street, if the train is delayed and the delay is due to a fault in the uh, in the train. The, the manufacturer needs to pay a penalty to the operator. But it's just, it's just like financial innovation. Isn't it? It's not actually product innovation. No, it's not no. something that... Ultimately, ultimately, they need to do a lot of innovation in the design of the product as well because they need to ensure right. that it's... it's, it's uh, up and running. Well, it doesn't break down. It doesn't break down. I mean, it, exactly. it, creates, it creates that incentive, I guess, that um, you're going to make something well yes. if you are charging by the hour rather than something that you sell and, uh, and then say, well, look at that mug buying that. Uh, so th- that that approach obviously makes a great deal. Of and that's good for the planet as well because we create stuff that's more sustainable. Absolutely. And then the, the innovation of the product is that you, as I said, you are in layman term, you're tagging along a lot of different sensors and you those data and then uh, analytics of the data will greatly help uh, not just the pro, uh, the uh, the operator which is Avanti in this case but also network rail they can they can come up with lots of bottlenecks uh, in the country because they've got lots of data uh, around how the, the train has been driven in the case of Rolls Royce they are not providing lots of data to the airline as to if they take route X rather than route Y, they can save X amount of fuel or they will um they will they can they can probably make sure that the, the products, the engines are more healthier in the long run. So there are lots of consequences, good consequences, consequences coming out of these business models. One so that's a bit like Google Maps, isn't it? You know, yeah, like we, exactly. we started using Google Maps, and then all of a sudden it started telling us yeah. where the traffic bottlenecks were. I think, I think, and the, they started rerouting. Yeah, us. I think, I think the, ultimately it's about being efficient, being more productive, which is one of mm. the biggest issue issue uh, issues in the UK. How, how well, productivity is a massive thing, as we know. Isn't it? We've both spoken about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's definitely helping the productivity of, of firms, of the of the users, of the uh, of whoever is in the, in this network. Um, but also, it will it will greatly help the the sustainability aspect. So, one one of the skill sets then. So, I mean, first of all, is it is this like? It sounds like this is largely B two B type uh, like uh, services, business to business for those yeah. who don't mm. live in that world. And uh, to, yeah, and um, rather yeah. than consumer um, services. But uh, what is it that the, the strengths that we'd be providing? I mean, you you talked about how because is it mm. on background in financial services? Does that help? Because I can imagine, yes, we've built a lot of technology. To to enable financial services, a lot of it is very data driven. So we've got experts who can look at what's required, and it's often very detailed to come up with the with the solution. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So we've got that background, I guess, in the UK, and perhaps other countries haven't got that because they've not been driven as far as having to need to drive that efficiency because they're making all their money making stuff. Mm. Metal like, bashing. Metal bashing, yeah. Yeah. Two, two points. One, yes, the majority of the examples are into business-to-business context, but there are other examples that other companies have started to move into business-to-customer or business-to-consumer as well. So, for instance, there are uh, a, a couple of like a, a, a boiler manufacturers that have started to explore or experiment um, what we refer to as heat as a service or comfort as a service. So you you become agnostic of what's boilers you've got in a cupboard, all you care is a an ambient temperature at home and you pay for that. And everything that goes with the maintenance of the boiler, of how it's been run, et cetera, et cetera, is now part of the footprint of, of the manufacturer of uh, the boiler. So we've started to see some of these examples in business or customers uh, kind of um, uh, context as well. But the majority of the examples are still into B2B context. Going back to your point about why we're good at um, working with businesses, we've started to realize, and they can they, they know it too well as well, that selling products is very different selling services. And ultimately, these servitized contracts and advanced service business models, the, the relationship changes. So previously, you were a provider of the, the products, you were buying it, off you go. You now become a partner with your, uh, uh, you become a partner with your customer because their win is your win as well. They, uh, if they can hit their targets based on the contracts you've usually got, you get a slice of the, the profit and the sales, et cetera, as well. So ultimately, capturing data, knowing how the customer's operations actually work, et cetera, it's a partnership rather than a, uh, a transactional sales. And when it comes to the services sales force, from what I've seen, I think because of the heritage of being in a service economy, I feel that we, in the UK, we are better at selling services and becoming well, partners. So let's take an example then that you gave about that, you know, providing that ambient, that right ambient temperature yep. at home. So say I started a company called uh, Comfortable Home. Yep. And uh, we had a sales force out there saying, yeah, well, look, we're going to get into your house. We'll whip out whatever equipment that we don't need. We'll we'll do whatever we need to do, putting in sensors, putting in boilers, maybe uh, ground uh, uh, heat pumps going to work in your, in your area. Maybe it won't. Maybe you need solar cells. Don't worry about it. We'll cover all the expense of that and we'll come at a price for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you're using manufacturers the metal bashers or whatever yes, it is producing, that's the stuff. producing the stuff mm-hmm. you're buying it uh, but all you're doing is that relationship is not between those manufacturers and the customer it's between you and the customer and you've got that business to business relationship with those with those manufacturers and you build the interface that makes all of that smarter mm-hmm. is that what you're talking about it can be so there are different ways of which one of the one, one of the ways is as you explained so through the intermediaries for instance so I don't necessarily have to be the manufacturer who gets into the customer's or consumer's home. Um, that's one way of doing it. The specific examples um, is through the manufacturers directly, uh, that they're actually providing these type of services. And for some of the industries, so uh, when you talked about the innovation, and I want to also refer to product innovation, in a lot of the industries, the um Manufacturers gather a lot of data from the customers' operations or homes, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to assess how their product's been performed. And in the next iteration of the product design, they will make sure that the, the, the product is better designed, it's more efficient, et cetera, et cetera. And because it's the manufacturer who's got the design authority and the IP who can actually make those changes, sometimes in the B2B context, customers uh, prefer to work directly with the manufacturers because they've got this influence in the uh, in the design of the product as well. So going back to the, the example of, let's say, rolls of power by the hour, a lot of intermediaries and a lot of airlines do provide power by the hours for their own customers. But because the, the design authority remains with Rolls-Royce, they they are the ones who can actually change changes uh, any faults or anything in uh, if it's in the blades or in, in the the any part of the the engines they are the one who can actually make those changes and, and come up with a better design I mean, of the product 
just just sort of rolling this back a bit. We're, we're talking about mm. the, the servitized idea that you're talking yep. about. But if we take the, the ambient energy that, that, that Phil has, has decided to set up in his home and, 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 and find ways. OK, the hardware that we need from that, the, mm. the basics, the boiler, whatever it is, that's got to be manufactured. Correct. If part of that's the that's part of the, the growing option, is that something that Britain can step up? Can we, in fact, make more stuff, servitized or otherwise? Do we have capacity to do that in the way you're thinking? So do we use the servitization as an opportunity yeah. to do we expand? Build, do we build factories? To, yeah, to, to get into the manufacturing space in a way that's more integrated, I guess, with that service offering. Yes, I mean it depends on how you want to look at it. But with the current, uh, let's say, manufacturing base that you've got, as you mentioned it as well, one of the biggest challenges is the productivity aspect. Um, it's not just about building more manufacturing; it's just making sure that the current processes are are productive or efficient. And do you think we've got enough capacity then? I think we do. It's just, it's just we we need to overhaul some of these uh, uh, business models, some of the processes that we've got in place. Um, I don't see just building more manufacturing manufacturers or building more capacity in that sense would necessarily address some of the challenges that we're facing, um, some of the challenges around sustainability, some of the challenges around productivity. We just need to become more innovative. In, as I said, in the processes, in the business models, in how we interact with customers, in how we use digital technologies and data, to be honest. And I don't think we are yet, we are there yet, to be honest. And are um, we competitive economically? Because I'm thinking about this, uh, this factory, that national factory, producing mm. this stuff, perhaps at the same capacity we already have. We have to pay people to do it, mm -hmm. whichever part of it it is. Mm. And our wage inflation that we've had actually quite considerably in, in the last year or so, mm. maybe puts us in a non-competitive position as far as the rest of the world is concerned. And that's something we haven't really tackled. No, I agree. I agree. So uh, the, the the other aspects to look at this as well is the um, when you use digital uh, technologies like AI, etc. Uh, sometimes some of these int uh, interactions with the customers have become seamless because you can connect to the machine, um, understand what's going on, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You would not necessarily need to have people. Uh, traveling around to get to the customers, et cetera. That's got two sides. One is from the, let's say from the sustainability aspects, you can save a lot of journeys and CO2, et cetera. But from the other side, you think about, are we losing people on that front? Are we losing them? They the, like the maintenance folks, et cetera, et cetera. And but at the most basic level, if we're losing people, they're not earning. If they're not earning, they're not paying tax. If they're not paying tax, that money isn't going into the economy. Yes, but then the, the, if you look at if you look back at the innovating some of these processes, um, a couple of week, couple of months ago, um, I had a visit to a, a manufacturer um, up north. They, because of that specific thing, they are kind of like rerouting uh, the, their, their, their workforces to focus on some of the internal aspects of the of the manufacturer. So they were sending them to lots of uh, different trainings, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to help the manufacturers internally rather than a lot of the customer facing type activities to be to be more effective in the on the in the shop floor, to be more effective in the running some of these operations. But I, but I agree. I don't think necessarily yet that we are in this in that position when it comes to being competitive uh, because of the, the wages and salaries, etc. And in this services space, uh, in this mm. servitization space, and when I think of selling to the consumer, mm. I think of Google. You know, when you're talking about warm, you know, yeah. warming home, I think of Nest and all of mm. those things and all the smarts that sit behind that. And those online businesses, you know, and the, the there's a f half a dozen of them, they've all got experience of dealing with consumers and adding Absolutely. smarts to the whole experience. And they've got the cash sitting in their bank accounts where they can try stuff. I mean, we haven't got a, a, a chance against those players, have we? It's a very, very good point. I mean, if you speak with, there's an old example that if you speak with like GE and ask them about the uh, who's your biggest competitors, they will say Google, um, and they can be uh, disruptors in the whole ecosystem when it comes to like services like business models. But a lot of other companies have used the opportunity to to partner with these big uh, tech giants. Sure. Uh, That's the first to, stage to getting bought by them. Because, I mean, they, <laughs> they're, they're not, cynical, but you know, yeah, we but see that not, happening. 
Yeah, but then Google's and 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 um, um, let's say Amazon's and of this world, they may not be very much interested in becoming a manufacturer of, uh, let's say, gas turbines because they don't have the the capacity, they don't have the the, the knowledge, etc. But they are very good at analyzing the data right. for sure. So then we get back to saying, well, so, we've got a manufacturer. If we're going to partner with them, we've actually got to be. Got to make the manufacturing space. We've got to be metal bashers again. Yeah, and then 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 if you if you know how to get to the ecosystem or or what we refer to as value network of different companies that that each are doing what they're best at. So the manufacturer is actually producing something, and they partner with a uh, with a tech company um, to actually help them with the sensors and data analytics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then you partner with another intermediary who's who's very good at speaking with customers, etc. So the whole network will benefit. Uh, a lot more. So the cake is getting bigger and bigger and the slices are also getting right. bigger and bigger. But if the metal bashes um, are in China but, and the, the smarts are Google sitting in Silicon Valley, I mean, we're halfway mm. between the two. We can we can watch the money flow yeah. past. We're, what, what, I'm still struggling to find out how we fit into that equation. And, and, What's and, our unique point that's going yeah, to make Yeah, because, I mean, I suppose the cynic might sit back and say, it, well, hang on, there are things we do well at the moment in the city of London in terms of providing, for example, financial services. Why should we try and move into the manufacture space when other people do it cheaper. And, 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 you know, in that sense, where we are doing well, we should keep doing. I agree. Going back to the point about the, the, the Chinese and others, in the whole servitization economy or whatever you want to call it, requires a very, very um, reliable product. So if your product is not reliable, you cannot really guarantee the outcome. You cannot really guarantee the the uptime of the machine. Although a lot of other countries are also making reliable products, the reliability is key. And when it comes to these very sophisticated um, gas turbines or, or, or sophisticated machines, we are in Europe, we are still ahead and North America as well, comparing with... I would say, like Chinese market, etc. In terms yeah. of so quality, you'd say is still an area which that actually, we're ahead on. Which actually gets yeah. back to where we started this conversation before you joined us, Ali. I was saying one thing Britain has is, or used to have historically anyway, was prestige. We had yes. prestige brands. You know, Bentleys still sell for a quarter of a million yeah. pounds, and they're still doing quite well. Uh, you know, and we've and so uh, and then we had the whole cool Britannia thing as well, and we've got a film industry that people like to see the UK. You know, it's and when people come here on holiday they're buying stuff from harrods very often you know it mm. quintessentially british stuff they're buying a brand they're buying the they're buying brand britain so what does that brand britain stand for and i think it, mm. you know it does stand for quality and i think what Absolutely. you're also saying is that we can say well it's not just quality it's also smart yeah and also and a reliable. package of services that come along with whatever it is you've got it's a yeah. servitized offering as well yeah and it's a personal view that i've got always that i think in Britain, we are very, very good at, with customer service, understanding customers, speaking with customer, and that goes back to the heritage of being in a service economy, in the financial services, et cetera, et cetera. And big part of moving towards outcome-based contracts, outcome-based business models is to understand and being able to speak with customers, to understand their pain, to understand what is it that you can help them to do more for their own customers. And that is a unique ISP that we've got. Uh, that's that is really, really powerful. That's the, that's why I'm thinking that uh, we are ahead in that front. And that is a big element of moving towards these uh, outcome-based business models. I would say, but it's not necessarily creating more factory. Yes, that would that will help the economy. But I think we are we've got other stuff to sort to innovate um, to help the economy to become more productive. Than 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 those other options, I would suggest. All right, and because we're not because we've not got that uh, metal bashing instinct that we are trying to drive uh, productivity gains, it's, mm. it's like the devil's in the detail, isn't it? And so, if we, so if, if we're the detail thinkers, and I think that actually is a, uh, you know, having lived overseas, I think that's a because Australia is very much, you know, uh, uh, dig it up and ship it out. Mm. Uh, mm. Britain, we're the detail boys. We're the de well. We, I think we have had a bit of a reputation for being a bit more detail focused, mm. and I think it's something inherent in our education system. So maybe that's what we've got to leverage. So we actually do think think about things a bit yep. more. Oh, absolutely. The other two things that we need to also that would play a very very key role. We did a we did a survey with a lot of 
British companies um, a couple of years ago when we asked them about the the challenges to move towards outcome-based contracts. And the two biggest challenges that they had was the legal aspects and also the financial aspects, understanding the, the, the finances of this and understanding the legal aspects. And these are the two things that I think we are very good at in the city of London, for instance, when it comes to understanding some of these financial aspects of it. Uh, and also the the um, the legal as- aspects of because these are very complicated uh, uh, contracts between the, the provider and the customers etc cetera, etc cetera. and that that's the other two really uh, important aspects that we can leverage yeah. in the that, UK. That's the service economy that has kept us afloat for the last 20, 30 years via the city. And we haven't talked about, and we haven't got time to talk about it well, now, but um, that, uh, pharmaceuticals obviously is a very yeah, important industry to us as well. You can see that this is a, an area which we really benefit from that too. Look, it's been great talking to us. Yeah, no, no, it's been great talking to Ali, not great talking to us. <laughs> is that what I say? very good at that stuff. <laughs> it's um, been fantastic for you, He's a detail Ali. man, you see, Ali. <laughs> Ali, thank you very much for being with us. No, I hope you've it was, it was and interesting and there we are servitized yeah, economy the way forward yeah. Ali thanks thanks Ali cheers goodbye cheers yeah that was uh, that was really good for him wasn't it yes. and for us too yes oh yes <laughs> I can't not? believe I said that so um, yeah but uh, that whole detail thing yes. Yes. Uh, they, they're not so thing. good at it in America, are they? That's well, it. no, no. Uh, well, they are, but but in a different way. I mean, mm. they're. Uh, I, I don't know. Eye for detail is something we can say about Donald Trump. I mean, mm. I might be doing him a disservice. No, I mean, they, they do. Every, politics everywhere is done broad brush. It was done mm. broad brush during our election, mm. too. It was. But the problem that they face in America is that they do have actually an economy that's beginning to pick up, it's getting places, but it's not paying off, obviously, uh, for the Democrats at mm. the moment. Um, and it's not going to probably win them the election. But the bigger problem they've got, of is who in earth is going to be their candidate um, because uh, things are moving pretty fast mm. uh, and we may in fact see uh, a big change coming there's a tweet uh, yesterday from Joe Biden which says I'm sick mm. uh, so the, oh my goodness there's a confession coming out and then the next tweet is of Elon Musk and his rich buddies trying to buy this election if you agree pitch in here with yeah. a, a donate button so uh, so he's fighting isn't he to stay on there but whether he's going to be successful beyond this weekend for example uh, it well seems we will see we will discuss this next mm. week whatever situation we are if not by then who yeah. and what chance and, do they have of winning in November and if they don't win what's America going to be like with this uh, with this new dynamic we will dive into all that with a new vice president yeah it's there a bit scary isn't it we'll look it at is. all that next week on the Y Curve thanks for listening in today thanks bye the Y Curve